Thank you. Well, understanding how federal policies, sounds kind of boring, federal policies affect your family. Now, I'm a believer that some of the things that we have suffered uh, in the economy is because of failed government policy. I believe that deeply because it's something that is traceable. We can actually go back and follow that. When we look at the crisis in 2008, I believe that it is due to Jimmy Carter. Now, what I mean by that is back in Jimmy Carter's era, he developed a policy called the Community Reinvestment Act. And the Community Reinvestment Act, on the surface, seemed like a pretty good idea. As a matter of fact, it may be one of, well, not one of, the only thing that I probably agreed with that Jimmy Carter did. I thought, well, it makes sense. And it, worked, it went like this. If you're a bank, and you were in the inner city in some of the worst neighborhoods in the inner cities, or you're out in the country uh, in the rural areas and your primary uh, uh, customers are farmers, or in, in the city case, your primary customers are people that are maybe living in the poverty, uh, at the poverty level, you have an obligation that if you're going to do your banking there, you have an obligation to put a certain amount of money every year back into that community. If you were going to profit by that community, then you need to put money back into that community so that you can continue to thrive and you can continue to grow and the community can get better, thereby helping you grow even more. So putting money back into the community, community didn't mean some kind of project where you say, well, we're going to put a playground up. That was a part of it, but that wasn't what they were looking for. What they were looking for is lending. So you need, if you've got a, a, a fellow that wants to uh, buy a new piece of equipment to farm with, you almost have an obligation to somehow make that loan work to help that community out. If you have a, a fellow in the inner city that wants to uh, develop a little business of, of some sort and they come to you for funding, you ought to try to find a way to make that work to grow the community. Pretty, pretty good idea. And it was. And it went on for years where there was a requirement. And they actually had an organization that audited banks and the community reinvestment uh, uh, compliance guy at the bank, you know, you didn't like that much when the auditors were coming. And then the auditors said, look, show us what you've done and how much money you've spent. And we're going to see if that fits the requirement and get you off the hook. There were banks that moved out. There were banks saying, we're not doing this. We're gonna, we'll do it, but we're going to do it in a community where we're not going to be at risk or something like that. So this went along for years. Uh, Bill Clinton came along and Bill Clinton uh, hired a guy for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and he hired a guy by the name of Frank Raines. And he said to Frank Raines, he said, here's the deal, Frank. I want more than 50% of the mortgages that we have, we being Fannie and Freddie Mac that's guaranteeing, the 50% of those mortgages, I want more than 50% of them to be in affordable housing. You know, low-income people or, you know, that kind of housing. And Frank Raines says, you can't do that. It's impossible. There's no market. There, you, you can't do that. So, of course, the deal was we'll create the market. They got a, they got a hold of some uh, people like uh, Countrywide Mortgage and Washington Mutual and those kinds of companies, and they set up satellite offices around the country, and they basically said to them, hey, look, don't whine and moan about making a loan to this person for a mortgage. Don't worry about their qualifications or all that thing. Just make the loan because you've got nothing to lose because we're going to buy the mortgage from you. So we're taking on all the risk. You just have to originate the loan and we'll take it. That was the deal. It was pretty simple. Now, those, I think most of the banks knew that this was going to come back to haunt them. But they had a gun to their head uh, almost literally in the sense that they were forced to do this and they did it. Now, Countrywide and Washington Mutual went bankrupt as a result of this. 
this started, the, this, is, this was the catalyst to the financial crisis. This is what kicked it off and really got it rolling in 2008 when all of that started tumble, came tumbling down where you have these subprime mortgages that just weren't working. And we started to see foreclosures, banks were overextended, but yet the regulators, even though they were told to make these loans, were coming in and saying, wait a minute, you've got your loan, your loan to asset value. So let me just tell you that in a, in a good sound banking situation, if I'm a bank and I have $10, uh, I have $1 worth of deposit in my bank, then they would say, well, you know, if they're good solid loans, you can loan $10 to that, okay? And that sounds like a lot, but that, that worked for years and it was a very prudent way of loaning. So they would get out there and they try to get deposits in right? They would use those deposits and the savings monies and all those things, and they would lend them back out to the community. And it's a pretty good system. Well, at the height of the crisis, it was about uh, 88 to 1. So it got a little bit out of skew, and the regulator said, wait a minute, this has to stop. So all of this compliance started, and everything came tumbling down. There were a lot of other uh, federal policies that entered into this that caused, in my opinion, that really caused the crisis. Now, we can blame Wall Street, we can blame the bankers, and yes, listen, listen there was a lot of that there, okay? There was a lot of greed, there was a lot of issues in Wall Street, but there's always been greed. Since the days of the money changers in the temple, there has always been been greed. There has always been those issues, but it is not the majority. It's not, it's a small minority. Yes, they mess it up for a lot of people, but it's not the norm, but there's always been greed. Now, here's the beauty of greed, if there's a, if there's a beauty in it in that kind of system. The greatest regulator that has ever existed in a free market economy is the fear of failure. You know, company, nobody wants to fail. Though they may be greedy, and they may be trying to do all these things to make as much money as they can, they really don't want to be the guy that has laid off 4,000 people and gone out of business. Because remember, they're greedy because they're ego-driven, they're pride-driven, all those things, and the last thing they want to do is have failure. So they try to walk that line. So a great regulator was a fear of failure. Well, we have all these failures in 2008, and in the government, in all their wisdom, they bailed them out. Now, here's what I believe about 2008. I was managing a lot of money in 2007. I didn't... I, I wish I could say I was really smart and I saw this coming. I didn't. But I did know something was wrong with the markets. I didn't know what it was other than it was overheated, it was overinflated, it was overvalued, and something had to give. In November of 2007, by the grace of God, I started to go to cash in the portfolios. And I got to about 40% cash which was an unusually high amount of money because I, I believed that 2008 was gonna be a problem. Then in March of 2008, Bear Stearns, which is a big investment banker, went bankrupt. Now, they, they got bailed out because 60 government lawyers against 10 uh, lawyers at Bank of America, they, they cut a deal to buy him out for literally pennies on the dollar, so it didn't look like a bankruptcy. So they basically got bailed out. I believe that if Washington Mutual would have been allowed to fail, I believe that Lehman Brothers might have started getting their act together. They, I think Lehman Brothers, because Lehman Brothers knew they were in trouble. Le Lehman Brothers would have been in total panic mode. And I believe from March to through the end of the summer, they would have been selling off assets like there's no tomorrow because they had assets all over the world and they would have been selling it off trying to raise some capital and maybe even spared, um, you know, uh, 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 failing. But all of a sudden, the moral hazard, the moral hazard being 
taking away the fear of failure. Hey, I'm fine. Surely, if they bailed out a stinking firm like Bear Stearns that was washed up 20 years ago, Bear Stearns was doing nothing for all practical purposes, surely they're not going to let us fail. Ben Bernanke in his wisdom, I guess, thought, well, I guess we better let them fail, and they let Lehman Brothers fail, and the spiral started. Failed government policy. It's all about the, it's all about the decisions that the government's made. If Lehman Brothers were to fail, if Bear Stearns were to fail, if General Motors were to fail, if all of those companies were to fail, we'd be so much, we'd be so far along in a true recovery today, you, you wouldn't believe what would be going on in this economy. But not only didn't we allow them to fail, not only did we create trillions of dollars of debt trying to bail them out, we created a moral hazard that now, today, we've got banks more greedy than ever because they don't have any fear or failure. The idea that Dodd-Frank took away this, this too big to fail is lunacy. It is virtually impossible for the federal government to allow Bank of America to fail or Citibank to fail. It would, be, it would mean instant depression. They would never allow that to happen. And they, those guys know that. Nobody's going to let Goldman Sachs fail or any of those big investment banks or even uh, the banks that we do banks banking with. The top five are never going to fail, and they know it. So Dodd-Frank was a joke. I believe that Dodd-Frank was very calculated by two of the smartest politicians that, that I've ever seen. Barney Frank, in particular, was a brilliant politician. You can, you can, you know, all those other things you're thinking about him, I agree with you, and you're right. But he was a brilliant politician. And remember, you might not remember this, I do, because I follow all this useless kind of stuff that probably doesn't mean much, but they were beginning to investigate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It was going to look as though, it was beginning to look as though the government was going to be blamed for their failed government policy, was going to be blamed for what had happened. So Barney Frank did a beautiful thing, and he developed this piece of legislation that totally shifted the media and the debate over to Wall Street. Changed everything. All of a sudden, nobody knew what was going on with the government or Fannie and Freddie Mac, none of that. It was it totally shifted. It was a brilliant piece of legislation from that standpoint, and it worked very well. All of a sudden, we had protesters on Wall Street. I remember being interviewed by somebody that said, well, what about this march on Wall Street? I said, what march on Wall Street? They don't even know where Wall Street is. They're like four blocks away. They're not even close to Wall Street. They, don't even, they can't even find Wall Street, so that says a lot about the credibility of protesting Wall Street. But all of that started and it shifted everybody's mind away from the failed government policy to the, the Wall Street and the big bankers and the fat cat bankers and all those kinds of things. So, so that has deeply impacted the way that the federal government and some of the decisions they have made is going to affect the way that we live, operate, do business, protect our family, and, and all of those things. That impacts our ability to be a good steward of what we have when the long reach of the government is so deep into our pockets and so deep in continuing their same failed policies. Banks right now are totally out of control. It's hard for me to believe that subprime mortgages are happening again. I mean, that is incomprehensible. I don't know how that could possibly happen. It's only been six years, and here we are. So we continue to see this pattern over and over again. So when, when we look at what is happening in our economy and what the impact of the federal government has been, the number one impact that we have had since then, not that we didn't have it to a certain extent uh, in the years prior to 2008, but then we immediately went into and totally out of control spending. And the, the idea of the mentality, the Keynesian mentality, or the just simply an ideology blinding politicians to common sense, we went into this spending our way out of this problem. 
It was nothing more complicated than that. So the very first thing we do is we've got to do a trillion dollar spending bill. Remember the shovel ready jobs. Well, unfortunately, when they were giving money to states for the shovel ready jobs, states were trying to figure out how they were going to pay their electric bill because they were in big, big trouble. So do you think they fixed roads and bridges? It was the last thing on their mind. It filled their budget gaps in the state budgets who most of those states have a constitutional amendment to have a balanced budget. So now they're getting the handout from the government for shovel-ready jobs that they didn't spend a nickel on shovel-ready jobs. Again, more failed government policy, both on the federal level and the state level, and that started the spiral of out-of-control spending because the government convinced themselves, the, the ideology of the government at the time convinced themselves that somehow this worked you know, this, this shovel-ready job. And then we had cash for clunkers and all these things. Just keep spending and we're going to get out of this. Nancy Pelosi saying things like, well, you know, people that are on unemployment actually contribute a great deal to GDP. She even made, she even made a statement of something along the lines that um, one dollar of unemployment creates like a dollar 20 or something. I forget the number intentionally, probably, because it aggravates me that it's going to collect, help the GDP. I mean, lunacy like that. And the old, the old story is, and, and the old story is that, you know, you, you, you dig a ditch and you fill it up and you keep people busy. That, that mentality that spending those dollars is impacting the economy. Yeah, it's impacting the economy. It's running up our debt without the revenues to support it because everybody's unemployed. And so the out-of-control spending created that cause of that, created the effect of more debt and more taxes. And we haven't seen the effects of the taxes yet. Well, so we've all felt it in some way, shape, or form. But... I say more taxes because we've got to pay for the spending. And I'm going to get to a little bit of, of ways and why we have to spend for that in a minute, but um, it's going to lead to much higher taxes, and it's already led to much higher debt. Then we have failed attempts. The government had these failed attempts to spend our way out of this, right? That was a failed attempt. So they had all this spending that turned into investments, that they called it, and those investments were going to be put into the economy so that it would spur GDP growth, and they attempted, again, to uh, veil the spending under the idea that they were investing in America and had these failed attempts, again, to spend our way out of it over and over again. That also led to more debt and will lead and has led already to more taxes. And that, that has been some of the causes, some of the effects. One of the biggest problems that we've had by the government is no fiscal policy coming out of Washington in the last 10 years. I was, as much as I loved George Bush and what he stood for because I believe George Bush loved America. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I loved so much about George Bush and still do. But I was critical. You all know I'm an equal criticizer. Republicans, Democrats, whatever. I criticized George Bush for taking his eye off the target of the economy at a time that our economy was starting to falter. And I criticized him for that uh, a great deal. And so we've had no fiscal policy coming out of Washington in 10 years. We've had a thing called the continued resolution on the budget. We haven't had a budget since this president's been in office. We've not had a budget. The reason why the continued resolution on the, the last budget we had, continuing that and adding to it, has been so easily passed is because, think about this, how can we hold our senators, our representatives accountable when we don't have a yardstick to measure them for their spending. There is no budget. There's no budget. I believe that we have a Congress that's learned, wait a minute, 
we were actually arguing against continued resolution. This is the greatest thing in the world. Nobody can say to me on the campaign trail, wait a minute, I thought we weren't going to exceed the budget for Medicare spending. We're over. Nobody knows what it is. There, there is no budget. There is no yardstick. They've taken that away. And we've had no real solid fiscal policy to get us out of the malaise that we're in coming out of Washington, D.C. And the problem with that, no fiscal uh, uh, again, no fiscal uh, policy means no accountability. So here we go in a hurting economy. We've got out of control spending. We've got this mentality of spending our way into prosperity. I wish that would work because we'd all be just so prosperous. Um, but, you know, spending our way into prosperity, we have all these kinds of things going in and no fiscal policy coming out. So the Federal Reserve has to take it upon themselves to do fiscal policy by f trying to force the hand of the government to do something. Unfortunately, it's never worked. And the Federal Reserve began the desperate policies of quantitative easing. Now, before I say that's a desperate policy, I probably shouldn't say that, because it has worked in the past, in past recessions. Now, I'm talking about quantitative easing to the tune of $800 million, not $4 trillion. 800 million, 800 million, I said, not billion, 800 million dollars. I'm talking about a slight stimulus that the Federal Reserve could easily exit out of. And it's worked in the past. Now, I don't, I'm not usually, you know, I don't, I, you know, I'm not saying that I, like I said, I didn't see the 2008. I saw something happening. I didn't see this particular thing happening. But I also said in 2008, when Lehman Brothers went down, I did 87 interviews in less than two weeks. I was, as a matter of fact, it probably did more to, uh, I think God used that more to uh, grow this ministry than anything else. Because people would interview me and say, well, I heard you had a radio program. Why don't we know about it? I said, I don't know why you don't know about it. You know, is it a good show? I said, well, I don't think it's that great, but some people like it. And, you know, it kind of went on. And, and you know, that's how I kind of, you know, it, it really, but on all those interviews, everybody said, what's going to happen? And, and some of the financial programs that were interviewing me said, well, surely the Fed's going to step in and do something. What are they going to do? I said, well, they can't do anything. They don't have any tools. They don't have any tools in their toolbox. I mean, they cut interest rates a little bit, but there's not a lot of room there. Then after that, they're done. There's nothing they can do. Well, what about, you know, buying bonds, quantitative easing? Buying, buying debt, can they do that? I said, yeah, they can do that. Uh, will they do it? Well, probably. I, I don't know when, but they're probably going to do some of that, but it's never going to work. So I said in 2008 and 2009, and I wrote an article about it in 2009, I said, quantitative easing is never, ever going to work again. Because this recession has totally changed the mindset of the American investor. And here's what I mean by that. Most of the money in this country is in the hands of the baby boomers, okay? The baby boomers, my generation has all the money. We have trillions of dollars in our 401ks and our IRAs. We were working all these years. So all the money's in the hand of baby boomers. Here's the problem, and this was my thesis about why this isn't going to work. The problem is that the baby boomers have now suffered through four recessions, some of them five, four recessions, and now they're getting ready to retire. So they've watched their accounts go up, come down. That's ah, all right, I got 20, 30 years, I'll be all right. Then they watch it go up again, come down. Eh, I got, you know, 10, 50, I'll be all right. Then they watch it go up again and come crashing down and wait and wait and wait for the recovery to get them back where they were. The difference is now, or I said in 2008, the difference is now, these people are going to be retiring in the next 10 years. They ain't doing this again. And sure enough, I was right. Well, if the wealth effect really takes off, they're gonna, I said, no, they're not. They're finished. They're not going to do it. So now you have the largest investing population that isn't going to participate in the economy. Not, forget the markets. They're not going to be invested. But they're not going to participate in the economy in the same way. And, and I, you know, in some of the liberal stations that I was being interviewed, I got challenged on that. We got argumentative. And it was a lot of fun for me because I enjoy aggravating people. So it was, you know, it, it was interesting. It was a lot of going back and forth and all those kinds of things. 
but I, I, I knew I was right. But here's what happened. I got probably one of the greatest surprises uh, that, that I could have had. I was right about that. But what I totally missed, I think is wonderful. And that is the younger generation, those 20 something, 30 something, it's almost like some of us, my father was a young working man during the depression. And I remember him telling me stories. And you know, if you have parents that lived in the, in the depression or grandparents, they were changed forever, you know, about their finances and way they, the way they thought. We're seeing young people now totally change. They've sat back and watched what happened. And they're thinking, you know, I'm working hard for my money. I'm not doing this. I'm watching my parents lose half their IRA. I'm not doing that. And the beautiful thing is that I believe that God has used this to shake up some young people. And I do town hall meetings around the country. I can't believe, I used to do town hall meetings five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, nothing but gray hair. I don't have anything against gray hair or no hair, especially I have nothing against no hair. But, you know, that's all I saw. I mean, I didn't have, I mean, if I had anybody younger than 55, it was like having a kid in the audience. Now I do these town hall meetings. It's, I, I bet 50% of it is young people. It's, an, it's a really neat thing. So now we've got a double whammy in the economy. So you've got the baby boomers. They're not doing it. They're not spending money. They're buying what they need, like we're supposed to do, not what they want. They're not doing any of that. And you've got the young people that are doing the same thing. They're paying down debt. They're getting rid of their student loans. They're preparing for this if it ever happens again. They're doing those kinds of things. That has changed the, the debate. That has changed the narrative totally on what is happening in the economy. So all the quantitative easing is never going to work. Now, let me just stop for a minute and explain quantitative easing. The Fed, it's not a government agency, is buying the government debt. Now, there's two reasons they're doing that. One reason is, this is a borderline conspiracy theory, and you know I'm not a conspiracy theory guy. You listen to me. I don't, I don't get, you know, go down those trails too much. But I believe the Treasury Department said we got a problem. I think they said, I think Timothy Geithner said, look, here's the deal. We don't have anybody buying our debt. We've got China dramatically reducing the debt they're buying. Japan dramatically reducing the debt they're buying. We need to print money because we got bills to pay and we don't have any income because nobody's working. And we can't print the money unless somebody buys it because that's how, we don't have a gold standard, right? So we've got to monetize what we print. The money we print doesn't have any value until somebody buys it. So we issue a double E bond for $100 and you go out and buy it for $50, you're giving the government a loan of $50. For that loan, they pay you interest on that double E bond. Well, that's done in a large scale too, where you know China comes in and buys $300 billion of bonds or debt. We now have that money in circulation because we can monetize it. That's how we monetize it. Well, that's not happening. So I believe Geithner went to Bernanke and said, we got a problem. What are we going to do? And Bernanke probably said, well, I'll buy, we'll buy the debt. You know, we'll buy it so we can continue to print it because we got to pay our light bill. So I believe that that's what happened. And at the same time, we're going to stimulate the economy because we're going to create a wealth effect by putting cheap money into the markets. When we put cheap money into the markets and we put these trillions of dollars that we're buying into the markets because they were buying mortgage-backed securities. They were buying some of the bad bonds uh, at first. They did all that. Then they were just buying uh, treasuries. But we're putting this market in the market, uh, this money in the market. That's going to raise and elevate markets. So that's exactly what happened. It's going to create a wealth effect. A wealth effect is a psychological effect that has generally worked in the past. When we go back through past recessions, creating that wealth effect has generally worked. And here's how it works. I'm going to see the markets go up, so I'm going to create this wealth effect by the markets going up in value. You all 
are going to, I learned that from being south at you all thing. We don't say that up north. And I've also learned that plural for you all is all you all. I don't get that. But anyway, you all, you, you all will see this IRA's going up, my 401K's going up, and the psychological, psychological effect is you feel like you have more money. You feel better off. You feel more secure because of that. And what do you think you do? You spend money. You spend money in the economy. So creating the wealth effect drives our economy because we are an economy that 71% of our GDP is based on us spending money. So the wealth effect works because you all think you're better off and you're going to spend money in the economy. And then we're really going to get better off because the economy is going to start thriving. Didn't work this time. It didn't work through quantitative easing one, two, three, or forever, I called it. It didn't work for any of those. It never worked. Now, the Fed's convinced that it did work. They have to keep saying how wonderful it worked. It never worked because how is it possible we could have 5.5% five unemployment and have 98 million people unemployed and have the lowest uh, labor participation rate since 1978? It didn't work. None of it worked. So the, the problem is the market still remained driven because of failed government policy of quantitative easing, lowering the value of the dollar, trashing the dollar. The dollar is going down. That creates inflation. That's a very good thing for the Fed. And that creates a, a weaker dollar, cheaper money, and it's going into the markets. Well, that in their minds is all a good thing because that's what is going to drive the economy, the markets. But here's the problem. What needs to drive the market is good old-fashioned 150-year stuff that has always driven the market and most markets. The economy is good. You're making money. You're getting a raise every year. You're buying stuff. And if you're buying stuff, the companies that manufacture that stuff have to manufacture more stuff because you keep buying it. And the companies that supply services, you're using those services. They've got to supply more of those services. GDP is going up because you're spending money. Their stock price goes up because their margins go up because their sales volumes go up. They become more valuable. As they become more valuable, you buy more stock because the stock is going up and you want to be a part of that so the bottom lines of those companies continue to get better and better all because the economy is doing good. Not because there's cheap money out there inflating the markets, because you're all buying stuff. Because you've got a job, you're getting raises, and you're spending that money in the economy. That's how it's supposed to work. In every recession that we've ever had, every recession we've ever had, when the economy recovers, poverty rate goes down. It's done nothing but go up every single year, every single quarter. During a recession, recovery, a true recovery, unemployment, full-time employment goes up. It's done nothing but go down. We have the highest record of part-time employment that we've ever had in the history of the nation. But those things go up. More people become work. The labor participation rate, it goes up. More people entering the workforce. None of that has happened. Poverty rate goes down. Unemployment goes up. GDP always goes up up in those kinds of economies because we're buying more stuff. GDP has been stagnant at best, and the only increases that it has had has been usually due to inflation or inflated 
numbers, but it really hasn't budged. In my opinion, GDP has been negative since this recession has started because it has never gone up large enough to keep up with population growth. Well, they conveniently keep the whole population growth out of the equation. That never used to be, but they do now. So every single year, we have young people graduating college entering into the workforce to the tune of a million. So that's population growth of the workforce, not counted. We have people graduating from high school that have made a decision to enter into the workforce. We have this, these new workers coming in. No, doesn't count. They're not counted. It's not a part of it. We're not counting that population growth. Why aren't we counting them? Because we don't have a way of counting them because they don't have a job. Oh, okay. Well, well they're not applying for a job. Well, why is that? Because there's no jobs to apply for. So they don't get counted. So we're, we're not, they're, not, they're not in that bad labor participation rate. They're not anywhere. They're not even being counted. So none of this has worked because we've got a false positive in the markets. And there are people, government, that are convinced that the economy has driven that. But none of the markers that indicate a growing economy have happened. I just named three of them, but there's so many more that have happened. We've had horrible uh, uh, production. We have horrible uh, industrial production. We've had literally um, no wage growth whatsoever. Even now, with a 5.5% uh, unemployment rate, we have no wage growth, which indicates that we don't have any real uh, growth. We've got an economy that is boasting, we have an administration that's boasting of a good economy. So if the economy is a good con economy, and I remind the president this on a regular basis on the radio, because I'm sure he's listening to me. <laughs> but I, but you know, I, I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, excuse me, Mr. President, you got to understand if you think the economy that's good, that's wonderful. It helps you sleep at night and you love yourself. Everybody loves you too and all that. That's great. That's wonderful. But here's the problem. We have a labor participation rate of 1978. So if the economy is better, is good, it's a 1978 economy. And I'm trying to figure out how in 2015, an ability to only have a workforce that we had in 1978 is a good thing. How can that possibly be a good thing? I mean, it... The, do, do you see the lack of correlation to what the reality is and what is really happening? And we never hear anybody, the economists, talk about 1978. So then I say, well, you know what? Let me, let me uh, just throw out there that I'm wrong because productivity has changed in America and we have robotics, we have computers, we have efficiencies, we have effective, effectiveness to produce that we never had in 1978. Okay, I'll give you that. So what's that take us up to, 1985? And say I'm wrong and it's 1995. It still stinks because we're living 15, 20 years, or in reality, 37 years from a labor participation rate. We've got 98 million people unemployed or unaccounted for. We don't know what they're doing. So then we get new uh, labor statistics coming out. I wrote an article about this, laying this all out. And we get a labor numbers coming out that say that the highest rate of unemployment and the people that can't get jobs is between the ages of 25 and 55. Well, wait a minute. They've been telling us that the reason labor participation rate is so low is because all the baby boomers are playing golf or sitting on the beach. They've all retired. And that's what they say. It's a just nothing... It's nothing more than an issue of we have all these retirees, so they're dropping out of the labor force. The highest retention rate in this recession, guess what? 60 and older. They're the only people keeping their jobs and they still have work and aren't leaving. It's the young people that aren't working. Do you see the deception? And nobody's, nobody's talking about that. And those numbers from BLS just came out last week. And nobody's talking about it. 
Because remember, we've all bought into the narrative that labor participation rate is not something we should even care about. So it's 1978. We had a lot of baby boomers retire. Well, that's not the case at all. And that's the government numbers, which I don't believe. But nonetheless, the government numbers are very, uh, you know, self-incriminating. You don't have to go to some conservative think tank to find that. So we've got Federal Reserve uh, totally desperate policies of creating a wealth effect not working. Not working. More failed government policy. So the attempts to, I already talked about this, but the attempts to create a wealth effect have totally failed. They're going to continue to fail. They're probably going to continue to do that. Now, we have a strong dollar. The strong dollar, I happen to believe, is a good thing. I think that we should strive to have a strong dollar, not a weak dollar. I don't care how bad it is for the markets. I don't care about that. It's good for America. It's good for any country to have a strong currency. It is a great thing. The Federal Reserve can't live with a strong currency because a strong cur currency, number one, is going to slow down the markets. And we are living in an environment we can't get any GDP growth. We have two options to get GDP growth, more failed government policy on the way. We have two, two options to get GDP growth up. One is we can cut government spending. How many think that's going to happen? Never going to happen. There's only one other, other option left is to get GDP growth. Well, the GDP growth isn't working, and it's not going to work in this current environment. So the only way you can get out of this is through inflation. Why? Because inflation will inflate GDP. If you get a high enough inflation, your $15, or $15 trillion worth of GDP could go to $17 trillion if inflation is 4 or 5%. Doesn't, well, it doesn't even have to be that high. So you have to inflate GDP. Well, why does that help? That helps because now the debt ratio to GDP goes down. And Washington believes that as long as the debt to GDP is somewhat in line, debt is fine and it's sustainable. And from a mathematical standpoint, there's probably some truth to that as long as you have a growing economy coming alongside of that. So the Fed has to, at some point, not raise interest rates, but cut interest rates in order to once again start to devalue the dollar. And they have to start allowing or actually trying to do some things that will get inflation to come in so they can at least get to their target of 2% to raise GDP. Something's going to give. So once again, I, I want to remind you that it's going to be, again, failed government policy that has been failing for the last six or seven years that's going to get us into the mess, in, in, into more of a mess. The only way we get out of a mess is true free market of a, economies uh, being allowed to work. It's not allowed to work because the government is disincentivizing capitalism. So we're not going to get GDP growth through a free market economy growing unless we see a radical change in administration in a hurry. And frankly, I don't know how long we have to wait for that, but it better change. We have to have real policies in Washington. And I never thought I'd see a day where I would be looking at the markets through the lens of what politicians are doing. That's really scary. I feel totally helpless sometimes as an analyst. I'm a guy that is, you know, constantly for years and years being do, doing analytical work. And I remember a day when all we worried about, those that were doing analytical work, the only thing we worried about was two things. We worried about an interruption in the flow of oil, and we worried about a geopolitical event, Ayatollah Khomeini or something like that in the 70s. And we worried about those kinds of things that could maybe have a war. They were, they were our just 
unforeseen. They were the things that we couldn't factor in. Everything else we had under control. But the geopolitical event was not a political event here. It was something happening in the Middle East or Europe or Eastern Europe or something like that. It wasn't something. We're, now we're, we're bringing that home. So the, the uncertainty of the political environment is really holding the economy back in dramatic, effa dramatic fashion. So now what we have is ID, we have this ideology-driven uh, policy, uh, even at the risk of totally ignoring the Constitution of the United States. If we could have fiscal policy that was tried and true to the Constitution of the United States, if we had... Americans that were sworn in to uphold the Constitution of the United States that actually read the preamble of the Constitution of the United States and, and the Declaration of Independence and understood that. And on the other hand, if we had American citizens that understand that we have the right we have the right, according to the Constitution, to step in and saying, you are not governing the governed according to the Constitution. So therefore, bye-bye. We we're not doing that. And we have a group of legislators in Washington that do not have the backbone to not do anything radical but to say you have certain accountability issues and you're not living up to that. This is bad for the country. It's against the Constitution of the United States that we are sworn to upheld, uphold. You've got to go. We don't have anybody in Washington right now that has the guts to wage that battle, to have that battle. Forget about winning the war, whether that actually happens, but to have that battle. Because I think the narrative changes if we have the battle, but we're not willing to do that. So we're ignoring the Constitution, and we have ideology driving policy in Washington. And the ideology has permeated every aisle in Washington. And somehow, we have the most economically inept Congress in the history of the United States, in my opinion that is buying into the narrative that debt is okay, that we've always had debt, we always will have debt, and debt is not insurmountable. I wrote an article about the true state of the economy after the last State of the Union speech. I'm sure a lot of you saw it. And I had a chart in there that charted some economic data after every State of the Union speech since uh, February 2009. And every single factor, with the exception of the one that everybody is talking about, the unemployment rate going down, that's going down as a result of people leaving the labor force. That's why that's going down. With the exception of that, everything else is pointing to big trouble. But the big thing that's important is our debt to GDP ratio. So. Congress now has bought into the idea that as long as our debt to GDP ratio is, you know, manageable, even if it's up to 80% of uh, debt to GDP, as long as our GDP continues to exceed it, we can probably grow our way out of this problem. Well, in 2013, some of you might remember this or remember the article or remember me saying this because I know I said it more than once. In 2013, after the State of the Union speech, our debt to GDP jumped dramatically. It jumped up almost 30%. And I, I charted that out there. And by the way, again, all the numbers are government numbers that I use. So uh, debt to GDP jumps up to 80-some 80, 80 percent. I believe, and I said it then, that the Fed's in total panic mode. I don't know what they're going to do, but they've got to be in total panic mode. Well, they did the only logical thing you could do change the way you calculate GDP. And you know my fire about that because I beat that horse over and over and over again because I was the only one talking about it. I, wasn't, I was more angry that the 
guy, every, everybody else, conservative media, Fox News, everybody, nobody was talking about that. So April of 2013, the Fed says, I got a fix. I'm going to go to the Department of Commerce and I'm going to say, look, we've got to change the way we calculate GDP. Let's start including these things. By the way, we now include things in GDP that no other developed nation in the world includes, includes just us. So you rent a video from Netflix, that's now included in GDP, and it wasn't before. I'm just using a simple example. But it doesn't create a job when you rent a video from Netflix. And it's money, but it doesn't create anything. It's not doing anything for the economy. So we started to create all these things that don't do anything for the economy, but it grows GDP. It makes the number bigger. Well, that didn't work so well. We got a 2%. So I remember, so that went into effect July of 2013. Well, GDP by the end of 2013 stunk. It wasn't a whole lot better. I wonder what it would have looked like under the old calculation. So that didn't work. At the end of this State of the Union, the last State of the Union speech, at the end of it, we were at 101% debt to GDP. So I said, and I haven't seen it yet, but I said, and you're, you all heard me say this, the Fed's got to be in total panic mode. What are they going to do? This is why I don't believe they can cut interest rates in June. They've got to be totally panic-stricken. And the only thing I believe they're going to do, and one of the things I think they're going to start doing, is we're going to start to see inflation come in. More failed government policy on top of failed government policy on top of failed government policy. Here's the biggest problem with all the th some of those things that I pointed out already. The, we have a total lack in Washington, first of all, to, we don't have the ability to think about the unintended consequences of what they're doing. They can't think about any, un I mean, they can't think about the unintended consequence of and eating six tacos before they're going to speak. I mean, they don't even, they can't even think that far ahead. So let alone the unintended consequence of, of anything in the economy. So that's a huge problem. That's, that's number one. They don't have the ability to think like that. Somebody asked me once, if you could have any job in Washington, what would it be? And I said, the job in Washington I'd like to have is one that doesn't exist, but I would like to take the job of chairing the committee that analyzes everything for the unintended consequence of what it is they're about to do. I would love to do that. I mean, that would be, uh, that would be the only job that I would ever want in Washington. And I probably really wouldn't want that either because I wouldn't want to be in the cesspool called Washington. But nonetheless, that, that is a huge, huge problem. So all of this unaccountability, this inability to do anything, again, more failed government policy on top of more failed government policy, and it continues on and on and on. And the only end to it is going to be maybe a collapse or a change in such that is going to incentivize some of the trillions of dollars on the sidelines to be coming back into the free market economy and truly start to turn things around. And I think that's a possible. No. I think if that money came in, it would truly change some things. The question is, there's not a will in Washington to do that because they believe everything is fine. So when we think about all the failed government policies that I've talked about, the problem is not only that these policies have not worked. Remember, this is a, this is a government that has proved themselves for the last 40 years that they're not capable of whether it be uh, the Postal Service, which I think is a, is a magnificent service, I truly do, but the government has totally messed it up. And I feel bad for the postal workers because I think we do something in America that no other country can do. I mean, I've been to the upper floors of the 30th Street Postal Service in Philadelphia where is a huge hub for the mail. And it is mind-boggling to me how I can mail a letter to California and go through that maze that I've seen and get to California in three or four days. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. We have an incredible system. The only reason they can't be profitable is because the Congress 
that has not done this to any other government agency demands that the Postal Service con contribute their pension money for their workers a year in advance. Nobody has to do that. Nobody has to do that. But the Postal Service has been doing it for 30 years. They don't have any money because they're contributing to the, 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 their pension fund so that all the senators and everybody else can make sure they get their money and every other federal worker, why it's draining any resources the Postal Service has. I could fix the Postal Service overnight. I mean, I mean, if you want a letter to go to, does anybody have a problem paying a buck 10 for a stamp to get to California? Or do you want to pay four bucks to FedEx or whatever? It is? I mean, who has a problem with that? That's number one. Does anybody really want to get their mail on a Saturday? Who cares? Piece of cake, stop it. I don't get my mail any day of the week. My wife I drives her nuts. Every time we come down the road, stop and get the mail. I, I, I can't stand opening that mailbox. I don't want to look at it. I, 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 don't want, I don't care if I ever get mail, let alone get it on Saturday. I mean, it wouldn't be that hard to fix. And just when you take a contribution for a pension out of your employee's pay, put it over into the pension fund like you're supposed to do. But you don't have to do it a year ahead of time to all the thousands of employees. Again, if we look at Conrail, if we look at Amtrak, Amtrak's had never had a profitable year in the history of Amtrak. I mean, the government doesn't have a very good track record, and this is a huge problem, failed government policy, yet they want to blame Wall Street and they want to blame the fat cat bankers. And I'm not, I used to be one of those greedy pigs that everybody doesn't like, and I don't have a, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not trying to defend them, but I'm just trying to say, that we've got to go back to failed government policy. And the biggest problem that we have, and people say, well, there's so much dysfunction in Washington. This Washington is so dysfunctional. And I always say, and you maybe have heard me say this, that dysfunction in Washington is not the cause of our problems. The dysfunction in Washington is the effect, not the cause. It is the effect of not having any leadership. The cause to our problem is no leadership in Washington. The cause to our problem in corporate America even is a lack of leadership. I said to Tim Wildman today at lunchtime, we were, we were talking, the, the president of uh, AFA, and I, we, were, we were just talking about politics and all the crazy things that are going on. And we were talking about this very thing, and we were talking about a particular corporation that we're, we're struggling with because of their stance that they're starting to take. And, we, and, and I said, you know, Tim, you and I are the ones to blame. Our generation are the ones to blame because we're the ones that raised up some of the leaders that are leading some of these corporations and we, and we didn't teach the leadership skills that they, they need and we didn't give them the backbone they need to say no to certain things. And it's a huge problem in corporate America. It's not just Washington, it's corporate America too. But dysfunction is not the problem. Leadership is the problem. Dysfunction now is the cause that we're all suffering with in Washington, D.C. And it's a huge problem. When we look at failed government policy, we're spending 45% of our dollars, 45% of our dollars going to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. 45%. And that's not including Obamacare. That's not counted in the number. We haven't figured that one out yet, and it's going to take some time. We've got 19% going to our national defense. That's probably the best 19% that we're paying. There's no doubt about it. As a former military guy, and, and, and I, I love the military. I appreciate it so much, and I, I think it's the only thing the government does well, but it's because that government officials keep their hands out of it and allow the generals uh, to, to run our military until the last four or five years when they've decided that they're the general. But aside from that, we pay 6% of our monies in interest on our debt. Now think about this. We spent, we spent $335 billion in interest last year on our debt, $335 billion. If interest rates get anywhere near normalized, well, Normalize is about four and a quarter, forget normalize. If interest rates get up to about three and a half percent, we're spending a trillion dollars in interest to service our debt. So we have a trillion dollars hitting our 18 trillion dollars worth of debt, a trillion dollars just in interest hitting every year. 
If you wonder why the cheap money policies are so powerful and why senior citizens can't make anything on CDs, it's because it's extremely intentional because the Fed is doing this balancing act of trying to keep inflation intact when they need inflation to get the GDP up, maybe get some growth up. They're trying to keep it in tow. At the very same time, they're trying to keep it in, in, in uh, interest rates down because inflation always leads to higher interest rates. But if higher interest rates go up, we're going to pay a trillion dollars on all this debt that the government has created. And that, uh, that the Fed is our number one debt holder. It's not China. We're still, we still see commentators every single day talking about China being our debt holder. What China? China's 1.2 trillion. The Fed is 4.3 trillion of our debt. So we, we're talking about China. China is nothing compared to what the Fed owes. So we have all this debt, and they've got to keep an interest rate in check. So how do we allow inflation when we need inflation, when inflation is going to cause interest rates to go up? And yes, senior citizens will be happy because they can get 4% on their CDs and maybe get a little bit of money to live off of. And I always say, I say this constantly, that if I were going to arrange a march on Washington, it would be millions of senior citizens marching not on the Capitol, but marching on K Street, where all the lobbyists are. And that's where all the seniors ought to be, marching on K Street because of all the lobbyist efforts that they've made, and maybe on the Fed, too, for these cheap, cheap interest rate policies. It's killing America, but you can see how we're in such a horrible place when we can't allow too much inflation to go in because the only way we can do that is we've got to manipulate the interest rate even more during an inflationary period of time because Treasury Department can't pay the interest on the debt. Huge, huge problem. And it's, it's a problem that I don't know that we're, we're going to get out of unless we have true, real growth in the economy. And I say all this because I want to remind all of you that the growth in the economy has to be real. I don't know if I said this, and I apologize if I'm repeating myself. I know I meant to, and then I digress, which I'm very good at. But the problem, when I was talking about some of the causes and effects with the government is, is not the, the problem with manipulating the numbers. That's a huge problem. It's not just a problem with the false positives and the false narratives that the government makes sure is out there like the economy is doing well you know, and the markets are thriving and the economy is doing great and unemployment is down and we're at 5.5% unemployment and poverty rate is getting in check and we're sharing the wealth and so on and so forth and all these kinds of things. The problem with that deception is that eventually you start believing it. If you're doing that day in and day out on a regular basis, and I happen to think this is the biggest problem with Wall Street right now, is you start believing the lies. Now, that's a huge, huge problem. The bigger problem even than that is when you start believing the lies, you start making decisions based on a lie. So now you're making a decision. It's why Enron... WorldCom, it's why those huge corporations went bankrupt. They manipulated their balance sheet for so many years. All of a sudden, you've got the CEO and even the CFO believing the numbers and making corporate decisions on growth and expansion based on lies. So they actually believed it so much, they said, oh, yeah, we can do that. Let's buy that company. Let's expand over here. We can do that. And they went, they went bankrupt. And that's where we are right now. It's not just the deception and the lies. It's not that we've just believed all these deception and lies. And we've got Wall Street doing the same thing. We've got, we've got uh, you know, uh, Fox Business and CNBC and Bloomberg believing so much of these lies that everybody's starting to make decisions based upon the lies. So now we've got common, ordinary, regular mom and pop investors, people like you that are trying to survive all of this, that are trying to figure out a way to get, get by 
on what they have and yet you're trying to invest a little bit of money, you start believing the lies too and then you all start making decisions based on the same lies that they're making decisions on and you start doing some things that are going to lead to disaster. They're going to lead to disaster in your portfolios. And that's my biggest concern and that's why I'm so adamant about the what the federal what the what the federal government is doing by way of policies why and how that is impacting your lives every single day i know people that say well dan i don't have any investments i don't i don't do any of that i'm in cd's and all this i don't really care about any of this stuff you better care because all of this whether you have investments or not is going to be impacting your ability to go grocery shopping impacting your ability to pay your electric bill impacting your ability to have a job all of those things are going to impact you in some way, shape, or form. Form. There's no get a, getting around it. Remember, I don't care how much oil we have. If the economy continues to tank, you're going to be paying five dollars a gallon for gasoline. Listen, there is an ideology in Washington that wants five dollar a gasoline dramatically because they want an electric car in everybody's driveway, and you know that ideology permeates everything, and I don't want it to permeate the decisions you are making. And that's why I'm so adamant about the, the decisions and the policies that the, the Fed is making that we don't allow it to affect our families. We can't allow ourselves to make decision over an irrational, totally irrational enthusiasm about what's going on in the market. We cannot allow that to happen. And every day when we're ready to make that decision, we have to ask ourselves, are we better off than we were five years ago? And a, the best case scenario is you're at the same place that you were five years ago. But are we better off than we were five years ago? Are we leaving our children and grandchildren a better country than what we found? And when you ask yourselves that, it immediately is going to flash in your brain that all of this stuff is deception. It's all deception. And I'm not making a decision based on these lies because my goal is to protect our, my family. And maybe you live by yourself. That's your family. And that's what, you know, there, we, we have to understand that God doesn't want us to starve. What father would, wouldn't want their child to provide for themselves? And if you're a, a widow or a widower and you're living by yourself, that's you. That's your family. We have a responsibility to those under our roof, as Paul told Timothy. We have a responsibility for that. And even if it's for you, you have to make good decisions. And you don't need to listen to me every day to make a good decision. You don't need to do a whole lot of analytical work to make good decisions. You don't need that because all of you here are so much smarter than those in Washington. And you got to just use your common sense and maybe a God-given check in your spirit to say, wait a minute, what did Dan say? Am I better off today than I was five years ago? Am I leaving the next generation a better place? No, I don't care that I don't know all the uh, intricacies and, the, and the, the minute details of why we are in this problem, but I do know this. You know what I knew in 2007 when I said I couldn't predict what was happening, but I knew this. Something was wrong. Something wasn't right. You all know that if you think about where you are. How could we possibly have a 5.5% unemployment rate without seeing wages go up? It's impossible. It's never happened in the history of any recession. Because when we get near full employment, if we get anywhere from 6.5% unemployment on down, you all, have negotiating power with your boss, and your boss knows that. I can go down the road and get a buck fifty more an hour. You want to lose a good employee for ten years, and give me a and not give me the buck and a half? That's fine. I'll go down the road. Any employer with any kind of sense is going to be in a position 
when there is no labor pool out there, because there's five and a half percent unemployment, to say, I got it, I'll give you your buck and a quarter or whatever you want. I want to keep you. And if he doesn't, that's fine, because you go down the road and you get your buck and a quarter. And you start seeing a thriving economy. That always happens in a five and a half, six and a half percent unemployment on down. Always happens in that kind of situation. It is confirmation to you that we're, we're, we're living under this deception and lie that the economy is better. It can't be. There are certain things I can let go, that, but there are certain things that have to correlate with the good. So if this is good, there are certain things that just have to be good too. And if those other things aren't good too, then the thing that we're saying is good isn't so good. There's something wrong. And that's where we are today. And people say to me, Dan, you're so negative. Well, yeah, I'm kind of negative. But I'm negative because the news is negative. The problem is you're hearing the good news and I'm reading between the lines and seeing all the bad news because I'm looking at all the other numbers. You all just have to follow your instincts and understand where we are. If you don't want the federal, the, the governmental failed policies to impact your life, then you've got to just follow some of your instincts. I got a slide and some information from George Barna. He did a, a program once, and I asked him if I could have the PowerPoint slides, and he said yes. But one of the things that I loved was a slide that said you can make a difference to give people some, some hope. And it, it says, you know, know what you believe and why you believe it. And, you know, based on biblical principles. I don't care what happens in this economy. I don't care if it's good, bad, indifferent, lousy. I'm standing in a soup line. I'm going to do what honors God. And I'm going to do what honors God with my money. I'm going to do what honors God in everything I do. And I am going to fall under the veil of protection and the hedge of protection that God is going to give me because he promised me he would. And I believe in that promise. And I'm going to make decisions based on that. I am going to decide that I am going to be strong and courageous. I, said, I say all the time that when the Lord returns, I will be found with a sword in my hand. And I will be found with a sword in my hand. And, and the sword, the word of God, and the fight in my heart to, have the, the, to carry the sword. I will not be found. And maybe this is that soldier mentality in me. But as a soldier of Jesus Christ, I won't be found curled up in fetal position praying. I pray every single morning. I start my day at 2.30, 3 o'clock every morning, and I start praying that someone would, someone would come into the life of this president and lead he and his wife for the sake of his children, for the sake of his co this country, to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. I pray it every single morning. And I pray for this country every single morning. I am not minimizing the power of prayer. But there comes a day when we've laid the fleece out and we know what God wants us to do. We've got to put our armor on and be willing to fight. We, we need to be Gideons. We need to be Esthers. We need to be Deborahs. We need to fight. And the, the, the Israelites fought tooth and nail for what they believed in because they know they were under the protective hedge of God. We've got to place our hope in that and place our confidence in the fact that we're not going to be blinded by what the world is telling us. We're not going to be blinded by the ideology that all of Capitol Hill is blinded by. And I, I, I preface that by saying, because I need to, because I get all these emails when I don't, that I know there's strong and great people on Capitol Hill. There, I, I know that. I mean, there's 535 men and women on Capitol Hill serving this country. There's a remnant. 
I don't think it's huge, but there's 50, 60. I mean, there are, there are solid, solid people on Capitol Hill, and I believe that. And here's what else I know. When we look at the Word of God, think about what God has done through all of history with a remnant. Think about it. He has done some mighty, mighty work through a remnant. If we can't place our hope in that, and maybe we're all the remnant here, but when you make decisions and everybody else around you is allowing the failed government policies to impact your family and your life and your ability to be a good steward, to have a good job, to work hard, to do all the things that you know you are appointed by God to do, you're not allowing that narrative that is out there to impact you and you're willing to fight for the right narrative. If we would do that, as George Barna uh, talks about, so uh, just so effectively that we have so much hope if we would stand up and vote. If 11% more of evangelical Christians voted, this world would look totally different. It would look totally different than it does today. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that this state that we're in in this country right now, including its politicians, is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us because this is for, to bring us to our knees so that we'll stand up on our feet and fight. This is to, bring, to wake up a sleeping giant called conservative evangelical Americans, for, for lack of better, to get up and fight. And this has been a blessing to us, but don't get duped to thinking that the ideology that has permeated Washington is the correct narrative. It isn't. And look, I'm just a math guy. I'm just a guy that likes to do uh, math. And I believe that there's truth in numbers. It is what it is. When you add the numbers up, it is what it is. And when I add the numbers up of this economy, it doesn't work. Can you... Can you do a dog and pony show over here and some smoke and mirrors over here to make things look good? Sure you can. And we've been living, and we may, we may be able to do that for a number uh, of years, but we gotta start preparing now for sure, but we've gotta make sure that we don't buy into the narrative that it, it, it's, it's better than we think and that we're willing to fight to make it better. I have so much hope, and as negative as I sound, there's two things that, that I love, and I love the Word of God more than anything in the world. I came to the Word of God late in life, so I have an incredible appreciation for it, and I love this country more than anything. I mean, this, this country, and we, we've traveled around the world in the lousy state that it's in right now, and some of you know this, is the greatest country on the face of this earth. And I believe with all my heart that the Constitution of the United States the Declaration of Independence was preserved for us today because God's hand was actively involved in writing those words. I know that for a fact, and I say that because no other nation in the history of the world has ever withstood an unparalleled 238 years of freedom like the United States of America has, and that could only be by the hand of God. Amen. It can't be any other way. And we've got to put our faith and our trust in that, but we've got to be willing to fight for it. So don't buy into the narrative. Remember that, yes, the federal government is, is certainly made up of a series of failed government policies that seem to all be coming home to roost at one time. And I haven't even talked about uh, the global impact and the global economy that you hear me talk about every day. But I'm talking from a mathematical standpoint. When I factor in what is going on globally, again, no correlation to the fact that we should have markets doing what they're doing. There is just no correlation to it. And at some point in time, it's, it's, going to, it's going to crash. I wish I knew when. I just know it's going to happen. I know that someday I'll be right. I hope I'm alive uh, to, to, say, to, to see it. I know I'm going to be right. I happen to think it's going to be this year, and there's as good a chance as ever of it being this year. So stay focused on 
where we are today and are we better? And if you make your decisions based on that, until you can say to yourself, you know what? This is a great year. Things are so much better. My friends have jobs. Everybody around me is working. People are getting raises. We're spending money. Things are so much better than they were. Until you can do that and make decisions based on that, make decisions based on everywhere I look, we still have major, major issues and problems. And I think if you do that, you'll be fine. You'll be able to protect yourselves and your families uh, against some of this failed government policy. Thank you so much. I sure appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.